Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk, Israel National Radio. Today is the eighth day of the month of our redemption, Nisan 5774. It also happens to be April 4th, 8th, that is, 2014. And this week is Parshat Acharemot, and it is called Shabbat Hagadol, the great Sabbath is the Sabbath before Passover. The words come from a verse at the end of the prophetic reading of the Haftarah, which says that God is going to be sending Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day, Shabbat HaGadol. And this will be our pre-Passover Temple Talk, as a week from today, is actually the first day of Passover, so we will be returning to Temple Talk on Isruchag, the day after the festival, which is the 22nd day of Nisan and April. And Passover indeed is upon us in another week. And everybody's very busy getting ready, scouring their houses, scouring their souls, remaking, redoing, revamping their personalities to make them leaven-free. Getting their uh, Passover offerings ready? Getting their Passover the offerings ready, uh, tying them to the bedposts. That's going to be this Thursday, the 10th of Nisan, four days before. Ere Pesach, got to get your sheep, your lamb all ready for the Passover offering. And is it going to be this year? You know, every year that goes by, there have been more and more people talking about it in the streets. You know, people s- literally stop me in the street and they say, Rabbi, we bring a Passover offering this year. I just can't, I can't leave the house. I can't leave the building here without somebody stopping me saying what's going to be with the Passover offering. It wasn't always like that, but in, in recent years, the interest and has grown and the dynamic is being increased exponentially. And there, there is a groundswell of understanding, re-education, feeling, revitalization in our people that is demanding the right of the Jewish people to act like the Jewish people are supposed to act. What's holding us back? Um, Is it the government? Is it ourselves? Is it our rabbis? Is it our own own, uh, incompetence? That remains to be seen, but one thing is for sure. Passover is all about this eternal covenant that the Jewish people have with the Almighty, and the sparks that fly from that covenant, they radiate to the whole world. That covenant is based on the eternal ordinance of the Passover offering. This Thursday, here in Jerusalem, on the 10th day of uh, the month of Nisan, which indeed is the day that, uh, according to the Torah, um, we begin preparing for the Passover offering. It actually uh, comes from uh, the verse in Parshat Bo, where Hashem says on the, on the first day, let's just read that here. Let's have one second. Let's just read that verse. It just happen to have a Tanakh just right here. Just to have a Tanakh right here. How oh, convenient. And the verse the that we're pocket. referring to, of course, is right here, where we read... A lot of pages turning here. A lot of pages. This is so uh, old school, turning pages. It's true. You're not, uh, you know, swiping your Speak to the entire assembly of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they shall take for themselves, each man, a lamb or kid for each father's house, a lamb or kid for the household. This Thursday, the tenth of Nisan, we're going to have a special symposium, a special time of study, practice and demonstration, reenactment of the Passover offering. This year's gathering promises to be the the best yet, the best in terms of the quality of our um, uh, lecturers. The, the, there are going to be Torah classes. There are going to be children's activities. There are going to be, it's going to be a whole um, happening in the Torah world in terms of study in terms of um, understanding and enthusiasm and uh, 
and uh, seeing is, is understanding and uh, actually having a demonstration of the uh, Passover offering and an explanation, a simultaneous explanation of what is happening, what you're seeing, I think is, is the perfect way to teach it because you can read it in books and you can study it in books, but until you actually see, uh, it's, it's a distant, it's distant, you know, it's, it's academic, but when you see it, it becomes very real. So this day of study, practice, and reenactment taking place this Thursday, the 10th of Nisan, the 10th of April, is going to be happening here in Jerusalem on Ben Sion Street in the Kiryat Moshe neighborhood of Jerusalem in the courtyard of the Talmud Torah, Me'or HaTorah. And it is sponsored and um, participating in it are the temple movements, and it's being organized by the Temple Institute. And the, in fact, the actual reenactment of the Passover offering is going to be facilitated by um, Kohanim that are being trained in the special school of the Temple Institute. The schedule is as follows. Um, beginning at 5 o'clock, there is going to be special um, sessions of studying the laws of the Passover offering. We have a number of uh, speakers, um, well-known rabbinical personalities are going to be speaking on different aspects of the Torah principle of the Passover offering. Rabbi Shabtai Rappaport, who is the dean of the Beit Midrash of the Institute for Advanced Torah Study at Bar Ilan University. Rabbi Israel Ariel, founder and head of the Temple Institute. Rabbi Uri Sharki from Machon Meir. Rabbi Menachem Borstein of the Pua Institute, Rabbi Yitzchak Shapira of the Ode Yosef Chai Yeshiva, Rabbi Yoel Schwartz, Dean of Devar Yerushalayim Yeshiva. All of these rabbis are going to be giving lessons and instruction, various aspects of the Korban Pesach. During that time, at the time of the classes, there are going to be children's activities conducted by the Temple Institute's Academy of Temple Studies. And then at quarter to seven, there will be commence the actual... Um, drill, practice, and reenactment of the Passover offering, which is going to be conducted by members of the Temple Institute's School for Kohanim, who will be wearing kosher priestly garments. And as the offering is enacted, Hala will be sung by a Levitical choir, and everything will be done according to the exact requirements of Halakha. There are also going to be some addresses, uh, greetings, blessings by some very well-renowned um, rabbis, and entrance, of course, is free. And I think the main thing about this that's so exciting is the fact that it's taking place at all, the fact that it's taking place on a, on a much more organized, um, well-thought-out, grand scale than ever before, Past events in previous years have drawn hundreds, good hundred, good hundreds of people have come, have come to these symposiums, these uh, pre-Passover symposiums. This year's event promises to be, uh, I think, the most exciting and the most important of all. I can tell already the level on which it's being prepared and presented is going to is going to be uh, is going to bespeak the honor of the Torah. And the deep-rooted desire that is being that is felt by our people to renew the Passover, and it's a sign of the times. It's a sign of the times. The people of Israel are getting fed up with matzah balls and um, the seder, which is empty and with devoid its turkey, of its turkey neck shank bone. <laughs> <laughs> the Seder, which is nice, okay, it's Beautiful. nostalgic, it's it's um, reminiscent of something, but what's missing from it is it's very, very core. What's missing is, is, is the question, why, why is this night different from all other nights? Why on this night are we eating roast lamb? Exactly. We don't ask that question if we're not eating roast lamb. What but, a shame. But this whole thing, it's like it's not about a, culina a culinary... Um, um, Motivation. It's not about the menu. It's not about the taste of lamb. It's not about um, anything other than the honor of of Hashem. And and really, again, the the core essence of the Jewish experience and what Passover really means 
for the Jewish people and therefore for the whole world. And I, and I don't exaggerate when I say that wherever I go, people literally stop me and they say, what is the deal with the Passover offering? When? When are we going to be able to, to bring this as a people? More and more people every, every year realize that everything else is a, is a sham without our ability, without our desire to, uh, to do this. You know, more than anything, I think Passover is the birth of um, human rights for the whole world. On the one hand, if we want to just be, you know, if we just want to talk in, in politically correct terms, and this is true, by the way, I mean, Passover is about freedom. That's absolutely true. If, if someone were to ask me, uh, someone that, that is not of Israel, but that loves Hashem and the Torah, someone were to ask me, what, what is Passover for me? I would state unequivocally um, with all my heart that Passover is about becoming free from idolatry, standing up for the honor of Hashem, standing up to be a slave to no man, and that the essence of, uh, of freedom, which is so powerfully felt in these days, is, is the legacy that Israel bequeathed to the whole world when we left Egypt. That's, that's all true. But it's even, it's even more than that, because specifically, the the real issue is a person's stand and stance against idolatry on a personal level. And it did take a tremendous amount of courage and fortitude and be, most of all belief in Hashem to stand up to the e Egyptian taskmasters and to take the the, the uh, lamb into the house on the tenth of the uh, and to slaughter it and to fight idolatry. And that's really what's born on Passover. And that's why until we were able to bring the Passover offering um, at the site of the Holy Temple, the, the, the equation isn't really working. And <laughs> it's not really working. It's wonderful. Everything that we have is wonderful. We're, we're very upbeat. We have Midinat Yisrael. We're home. We're, we're, we're beginning um, the, 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 the process of the building of the temple. And that's what's going on here every day. There's no question about it. You can see that very clearly through everything that we've been sharing with you consistently. The beginning of the Holy Temple is well on its way. But until we, we realize that we are just kind of um, playing some kind of a game with our... With our um, you know, religiosity and our commitment until we're, we until we are able to come out and say it, say it to the the truth to the world without being ashamed or embarrassed or concerned. Say the truth to the to the world that the Torah is timeless, that the commandments of Hashem are up, are uh, upon us. They're, they they uh, obligate us that we have a mission in this world, only one mission, which is to extol and to and to sanctify Hashem's name in the eyes of the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's exactly what Passover is. And until then, it's just we're just being nostalgic. And that's what I think people are beginning to realize. And that's, the, that's, that's what's so beautiful here about <coughs> the popularity of, a, of an event like this and its attraction and the fact that so many people are, are saying, well, what are we going to do this Passover? How can we sit at the table again and, ta and talk the talk? And just you know, make these um, symbolic uh, gestures without it being real, without the bringing of of the Passover offering, which is the very definition of of the Jewish people to be able to bring the offering. So, w what does it mean to fight idolatry? What does it really mean? You know, every day when we say the Shema the paragraphs of the, of the Shema. Um, every single day we read the second paragraph. It's part of our prayers in the morning and in the evening. We read the paragraph called V'haya Im Shamo. It comes from Deuteronomy 11, beginning in verse 13, where it talks about the acceptance of the yoke of heaven and the um, meaning, uh, no, the acceptance of the commandments. Um, and it starts, if you will be, if it will be that if you will hearken to my commandments that I command you today to love Hashem your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I shall provide rain for your land in its proper time, the early and the late rains that you shall gather in your... It's this very beautiful idea of our commitment to keep the commandments. And further on, it, it, it talks about 
Um, the problem of serving other gods. Be, beware for yourselves, lest your heart be seduced, and you turn astray and serve gods of others and prostrate yourselves to them. Then the wrath of Hashem will blaze against you. And it goes on to talk about that. And, and every single day, we read this twice a day. It's like a major part of our prayer service. We repeat it to ourselves and it's got to be doing something. It's got to be going in. It's got, I mean, it must be considered by Hashem to be so important that we actually have this commandment every single day, at least twice a day, that we are saying this verse to ourselves. Twice a day for our whole lives, we're saying to ourselves, beware unless your heart be seduced and you turn astray and serve gods of others and prostrate yourselves to them. This is such a, an unbelievable thought. Why is it that we're saying this twice daily our whole lives if, if it weren't for the fact that it's a very real danger and perhaps, actually, it's what we're doing all the time. I mean, is anybody thinking about this? It's like people think about idolatry. They think it's like, oh, like, this is like, this is really a leftover, isn't it? Like what, what, like every day we have to say this paragraph that reminds us that you shouldn't bow down to an idol, to a stone, or that we shouldn't uh, worship the gods of, uh, of the nations or something like that. Oh, that's not what we're doing today. But no, this is part of the daily Shema. This is like the biggest problem that we have. And so we have to keep drumming it into ourselves every single day. And you know that if you don't hear the words that, you're, that you yourself are saying when you recite these paragraphs, then you're not, you don't fulfill the commandment. You have to hear yourself every single day say, be careful lest your heart be seduced and you go astray after false go gods. And I'm thinking that the reason that we do this is because we're guilty of it every single day. And Hashem is warning us and reminding us every single day, watch out, watch out, step away from there. This is your nature and you're doing it again. And, and examine what you're doing and take a look at it again and go over it again and make sure that you're not, that you're not, that you're not um, guilty of that again. And I think that this is what the message of, of Passover is really all about, um, multiplied by, by a tremendous amount. It's all about freeing ourselves from all these vestiges of, of false gods. And right now, frankly, the reason that we're not bringing the Passover offering is because we are basically, if not serving, we certainly are afraid of, we certainly are involved on some level with, with, with false gods, but, but they just have different names. They, the names might be... Um, the international community. Keep going, Yitzchak. Give me, give me some more names. Um, the UN, the United States, our friends around the world, uh, PETA, uh, animal rights, um, uh, the you know, uh, staying, uh, being part of the, the consensus, politically correct. See, this the is the thing. In the first part of your of, of your statement, the first things that you were mentioned, they were more like focused on external forces. I'm more concerned about the internal forces from within us because um, it, it's like, you know, something happened this week that was very, very um, important extremely important event that we need to report on. There was, a, there was a special session of a of a Knesset committee that has been formed. It's a subcommittee, right? It's, and it's been formed especially to investigate the claims of the Jewish uh, people who ascend to the Temple Mount to listen and to investigate their claims of police discrimination. Yesterday, this session, uh, this committee met, this subcommittee met for the first time and actually heard the testimony of Jews who ascend to the Temple Mount. And um, the amazing thing is that it's like there are people that are constantly talking about human rights and how important it is and how they're absolutely in favor of everybody's human rights and of everybody being able to pray and they would never stop anyone from being able to do that. But when it comes to... This subject, for example, of the, a Jew being able to pray on the Temple Mount, there were very heated words at this subcommittee yesterday in the, in the Knesset, wherein uh, some left-leaning uh, members of Knesset actually said in so many, in so many words, listen, I'm all in favor of, uh, of uh, human rights, but I won't accept your human rights on the Temple Mount. No, no, you have them, but 
I know that what you really mean when you talk about your 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 human rights and your right to be able to pray is that you what you're really coming from a different place because you're coming from this from this ultra nationalist um, you know. Um, uh, standpoint that you and I know that what's really hiding here in your agenda deep down is that you want to be able to build a temple and so we're not in favor of that here in other words we pick what <laughs> what human rights really mean and we'll decide when to exercise and when to put down the individual's right for for freedom and that actually is the opposite, the opposite, the very opposite of what Passover is, is all about. So what I'm trying to say is I, I think that, we, that what the Shema is reminding us of, the words that we say to ourselves every day, is that we are our own worst enemy and that the, and that the, the false gods that we deal with, that we are confronted by, that perhaps we worship, that we, we conjure up, they're of our own making and they're our, they're our own... Um, they're of our own doing. You know, uh, I have much to say about this, Rabbi, and I'm going to ask your permission when we begin the second half of the show to let me go on my own little rant. Please do. It's hard. I know I can't rant uh, in the same uh, Ramah, in the same uh, style and, 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 uh, as, as you do, but the same passion oh, and sure the bombacity. Because you've been, you've just done some really over-the-top performances. Oh, lately. I'm a professional mentor. But um, I'm going to give it my best. But in short, and this is what I'm going to expand on later, after the destruction of this of the Second Temple, the Romans forbid the pa- Passover offering, and then the Byzantines forbade it. Then it was the Muslims who forbade it, and then it was the the Christians who forbade it. Then the Muslims again. Then the Ottomans and the British, and now it's the Israeli government. The reason, on the surface, that we don't do it, as you said before, you said, you know, it's like you began uh, mentioning external reasons, but uh, I want to talk about the, the internal reasons. It starts out ec- external, the Romans, et cetera, et cetera, but then it becomes the Israeli government. And why would the Israeli government forbid it? And now we're hitting on the heart of the matter, because that's the real internal issue. More about this, however, when we return. Be right back. Stay with us. We wish all of our listeners a healthy, happy, kosher Passover festival of freedom. May we really, really confront and slaughter idolatry and take a stand for the one God of Israel this Passover and every day. Stay with us. Be right back. Temple Talk, Israel National Radio. and welcome back to Temple Talk, Israel National Radio, UniversalTorah.com, Temple Institute's YouTube channel. Today, the eighth day of the month of Nisan, the first of our months, the months of our redemption, 5774, eighth day of the month of April, 2014. And Rabbi, here is my promised rant. But before I get to my promised rant, I just want to pause for, give you some food for thought. Uh, you mentioned the 10th of Nisan as a day that we, in Egypt, took the lambs, uh, which were uh, worshipped as gods in Egypt, and tied them to our bedposts uh, in order to have them for the 14th when we would do the actual offering, the slaughter of the lamb. And um, interesting that in the first, in the 10th day of the first month, uh, parallels somehow the tenth day of the seventh month, which is also the first month of the year of, uh, of uh, Tishrei, Yom Kippur, which is also a, a day of reckoning and, uh, you know, setting yourself apart and really s- examining who you are, what you're made of, uh, as you stand naked before God, as it were. Uh, now for my rant. There's much evidence, and I've been reading this, and it's in our literature, it's in the Talmudic literature, of the fact that after the destruction of the Second Temple, um, the Jews didn't passively uh, untie their lambs, as it were, and hang up their slaughtering knives, as it were, 
and say, okay, we're in exile now, no more Korban Pesach, no more Passover offering. As a matter of fact, for many, many years, decades, even longer, there persisted the practice among many of the sages to do a, a shechita, uh, slaughter a lamb on the 14th. Uh, that wasn't a korban Pesach. They understood that. And in fact, they would do something t- in order to differentiate it so it wouldn't be mistaken. Uh, one of the things they would do was they, uh, they would not uh, cook it on a spit as is commanded for the korban Pesach. So nobody should think that they're actually doing an offering which, which they couldn't do because there's no mikdash, there's no temple. But they weren't about to give up the practice of the shechita on the 14th. They weren't about to forget how it's done. They weren't about to go gentle into that good night of exile. No way. And we know this in many different instances. You know, the, the, the Kohanim priests, they kept their schedules for many, many, many decades after the destruction so that they could be ready if it's rebuilt. And, uh, Hundreds they could, of years, actually. Uh, and... Uh, and many people, many of these kohanim would not drink uh, alcohol during that period of the year in which they would be doing their service in the temple in case they should get called up. They want to be ready to do the service. Again, the Jews did not go gentle into the good night of exile, not after the uh, destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE, and not even after the the disastrous results of the uh, Bar Kokhba revolution, which was in 134 to 137, I think, CE. Even after that, and we know we've just uh, posted these things on our website and Facebook page, we heard from Jeffrey Wolf, of the persistent presence of Jews on the Temple Mount, prayer in the Temple Mount. But even the Korban Pesach, which in itself is the original act of defiance and of a cry for independence and an act that is also a cry and also an expression of independence and that forces independence on us because of the reaction that it gets. If nobody cared about it, it wouldn't be an act of independence. And it's, uh, it's still true even today. I mean, I can, uh, you can almost imagine how they felt that first Egypt in, in uh, the first Passover in Egypt as such an act of, of defiance because it's like, look, what, look at the reaction that some people have now when you talk about it. Yes, people are... Very, very strong reaction. How can reactions. you talk that way? How can you say that? You're going to cause a world war. What about the Muslims? And, What's the matter with you? And I want to address what you said earlier. You know, apparently, historically, there was a... The Jews in the land of Israel, after the destruction, continued in large numbers to shecht a, 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 a lamb on the 14th as a zecher, but as a real zecher, and they would eat the lamb on, 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 at the Seder night. Uh, of the Korban Pesach, whereas the Jewish community of Bavel uh, looked down upon that. And there was a struggle among the sages uh, as to which tradition would prevail. And ultimately, ultimately, the Galut, the exile tradition, prevailed. And that's when the practice of, of of the slaughtering of a lamb on the 14th eventually died out. Because we prevailed over ourselves ultimately. We convinced ourselves that it was no longer part of what we do, no longer appropriate. We need to wait until the appropriate time. And now that we've returned into the land of Israel and have gained sovereignty, we still have to shed that exile mentality and exile way of doing things because the same argument, as, as you just said a moment ago, is, is, is heard today. No, we're not ready for it. You know, we can't do it. The reactions will be too strong. How would we do it? You know, uh, it's, it doesn't seem right. I mean, that was then. This is now. And still, doing the Korban Pesach today, doing a Shechita on the 14th, even that is so frightening to people that it itself is an act of tremendous independence. And, uh, you know, I did that last year, and it was an amazing experience, an amazing uh, expression of freedom, and I'm doing it again this year. And uh, it was two of us last year. This year, someone else has joined us. I'm learning more and more about this. And I know there are other people around the country who do this. And I feel that, again, like with all revolutions, it comes from the people. And 
this may be a very iconoclastic thing. It may be halachically wrong for me to say this is my opinion only, not the opinion of the uh, <laughs> of the of the uh, owners or the uh, you know board of directors here. This is Yitzchak Rubin's opinion that when enough Jews take it upon themselves to defy th- their own self-imposed ban on a korban Pesach and do a shechita of, of a lamb on the 14th, our sages will start to take note, just like going up to the Temple Mount. When enough people do it, even though it's forbidden and we're not supposed to do it, all of a sudden, as even you're, you're going to explain in forbidden. a minute, it's yeah, not even yeah. forbidden. Nobody you've ever said it was not forbidden. Forbid. Well, God forbid it's not, not forbidden. Forbid. You just have to know what you're doing. And eventually the so governor will the come proof. and say, this is an impossible situation. Everybody's doing shechita all over the place. There's here's blood. the proof that you're completely right. And, and every word that you said is gold. Perfect. Why? Because first of all, it's the same mentality that keeps us from the Passover offering is what keeps the majority of the people from the Temple Mount. And it is the, it's the exile mentality that we have supplanted here, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But again, th- t- uh, take that. Um, in, and, and weigh that against what I began the program with, which is the tremendous enthusiasm that right. I'm, I'm seeing in, from, from new quarters, from new people. And every year that goes by, more and more interest in the renewal of the Passover, from people waking up and saying, there's something very wrong with this picture. This isn't what Passover is all about. We're here in Eretz Israel. We have the Temple Mount. Hashem says these verses. I don't understand. They say, I wear tefillin. I keep kosher. I keep Shabbat. I try to be a good Jew. Well, I see that there are things in the Torah that we don't do. So what? That's not our custom? I see that, that, that Hashem says in the Torah, this is an eternal obligation, like circumcision. That is so heavy. And uh, that, like circumcision, the Passover offering, how could we not be doing it? You know, you know um, Moshe Feiglin went up to the Temple Mount yesterday, and um, it was filmed, and it was amazing, an amazing walk that he took, and, and, and we're going to be having, uh, we're going to be putting that up with English subtitles. And he spoke very, on a very simple level about uh, what we're seeing on the Temple Mount and about the Passover offering, and he spoke about the need for the implementation of Israeli sovereignty. His theme that he always spoke about, uh, Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, Moshe Feiglin, on the Temple Mount, he said one thing, though, that was so amazing, I think it's one of the most profound statements that I've ever heard, he said, referring to the Passover offering and the fact that, you know, as, as we've taught consistently, there are two commandments in the Torah that are, that the non-compliance of these commandments are equally, they, e- they bring equally the spiritual punishment of courage, which is very, very serious, if you don't do circumcision and if you don't bring the Passover offering. So he said, you know what? The Passover offering is the national circumcision Mm -hmm. of the Jewish people. I thought that was such a beautiful understanding. Yes, the Passover offering is the is the Brit Mila Leumi. It's the national circumcision of the whole people that we have to undergo. And the fact is, it's this exile mentality that that uh, everything under the sun, you know, like. People are so happy to think that, uh, well, you know, Mashiach is going to take care of that. That's going to be, that's for another time. It's obviously not for now. We don't understand how that could possibly be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's just a big mishmash of Jewish history that we, that, that is going around in our heads. But what, what you mentioned, you know, that the same mentality says, well, you can't go to the Temple Mount at all because it's forbidden. That's not true. Everybody knows it's not true. You have to know where to go, but it is a mitzvah. It is a positive commandment to go to the Temple Mount. Maimonides explains you have to go there and show proper refer- proper reverence, and this is the place of prayer. So another very interesting development that happened at this at this Knesset subcommittee this week that where there they, these members of uh, Knesset and other government representatives were actually responding to the Jewish claims of police discrimination at the Temple Mount. Uh, you know that um, the long-standing opinion of the rabbinate is that nobody's supposed to go on the Temple Mount. And that is the, 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 the source of a tremendous amount of confusion. It's extremely unfortunate because, you know, you go to the Temple Mount, you go to, you go to ascend at the one gate that is allowed for, non, for non-Muslims to go up. And there's a big sign there from the rabbinate saying, because the Temple Mount is so holy, no people are allowed to go there. And people, and I take people to the Temple Mount all the time, and this is our life's work. We've been studying it for decades, right? And there's a sign that says nobody's allowed to go. So people say, well, what is that? And I say, you know what, unfortunately, and I don't want to say anything bad about the rabbin. And so I say, unfortunately, that sign is extremely unfortunate and misleading and inaccurate. I don't say it's just absolute falsehood. I say it's inaccurate. Why is it inaccurate? Because 
it makes it sound as if no one can go in the Temple Mount because we don't know where the Temple stood and God forbid you're going in the wrong place. That's what they say because they want to keep people away from there. Whatever you want to say, if you want to say that, that if you want to down the cuffs chut, that that's that's the reason that they do it. Their intentions are good, or if you want to say that they're that it's been politicized and they're not interested in dealing with it at all, whatever. The fact is, of course, it's not true. You have to study it like any other serious aspect of of Torah knowledge. That's a specialty because it's so complex and there are so many opinions. But it's very very doable to go to the Temple Mount which is what Hashem wants us to do. He wants us to be there. He wants us to be close to Him. He doesn't want us to uh, desecrate the holy place, but He wants us to take charge, to be interested, to, to show sovereignty, to go there to pray, to build the temple. Of course we have to go there. And of course when we go there, God forbid, God forbid, we do not tread on an area that we're not allowed to go. We prepare ourselves. We know exactly where to go. But what I wanted to say about this this changing mentality that's that's a first is that at this session that was held yesterday at the Knesset the rabbinate the rabbinate's representatives actually stated for the first time in living memory on record they said you know what we're not against people going to the temple mount as long as they know where they're going do you have any idea how, how monumental that statement is they said we are not against people who rely on the rabbis who know and who instruct exactly where to go. We're not against them going. And then they said, this is like, hold on to your seat. They said, you know what? They're going to look into the possibility of changing the language of that sign at the gate, which is so misleading and which Mm -hmm. makes it sound as if the great rabbis that we respect and revere, who are such great Torah scholars, is as, as if they're doing the wrong thing by going. They said maybe they'll change the statement to reflect more the accuracy of the fact that if you have the knowledge, you can go, which would be a great accomplishment. But, but Yitzhak, I, I was talking to you about the fact that, you know, on the one hand, there's this tremendous awakening, and, and we have this symposium coming up this week, and I'm sure it's going to be very well attended and very beautiful, and it's going to be a cross-section of the people, and it's going to show the throbbing pulse of awakening in, in the people, and by the way, there are going to be a lot of Jewish people, God willing, going up to the Temple Mount during Passover, and you can still contact us if you're going to be around, and we hope to be going several times, and we have some very important groups that are going to be going up, and it's all part of the Ali Ali Regal. It's part of the pilgrimage to the Temple. But on the other hand, you have these voices, like the one that I mentioned some that was said you know, by some, by some leftist-leaning member of the Knesset, oh, you people... You don't deserve. <laughs> you don't deserve your human rights. Yes, we're all in favor of human rights, and we're all even all in favor of prayer and of your ability to be able to pray on the temple. But wait, but but we're not going to allow that because we know what you really have in mind. You really want to build a temple. You really are these right wing fanatics. Whatever, whatever. But you saw, I gave you two articles that I was upset about that mm-hmm. have been around lately on the internet, written by Jews, one written by a rabbi. Um, about um, how this isn't the time to build a temple, and it's not even the time to pray on the Temple Mount, and it's very, and it's very, very um, um, ill-timed, and it's it's the wrong thing to want. And there's one line there in one of those articles. Can you hand it to me? I got I got to show you this. There's one line okay. that is just so incredible. I gotta I gotta find that. What did he say here? He said. This one article is called Rebuild the Temple, not, not in Our Time. And then there's another article called Prayer on the Temple Mount Can Wait. <laughs> and they're both horrible, and they're both written by, by learned the Jews, and they're both talking about how this is um, absolutely uh, a terrible idea and th- these people should be silenced. But listen to this line in this one article called Rebuild the Temple, not in Our Time. You know what? Here's the, here's the line. He writes, There is a long and venerated Jewish tradition to hope for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. There is also a long and venerated Jewish tradition of living without a temple. What? Uh-huh. And then he goes on to say, With the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks underway, there has been agitation for some Jews to assert more control over the Temple Mount, with accompanying Muslim voices of concern that their authority will be eroded. 
I don't understand this line. There's a long and venerated Jewish tradition of living without a temple. Did you know that there's a venerated tradition? Uh, I never heard of that tradition. Do, do we uh, venerate? Even, even I don't even venerate the tradition of, of longing for building the Holy Temple. We need to build the Holy Temple. We don't long but, for exactly. it for the sake so, of longing for it. So we you need see to how build he the put Holy it, Temple, He put it in such a way. That's, that's that whole it's, idea it's, of wrapped up in... in, in, in and and uh, insulate it from reality. It's so three beautiful. Times over. Pa- this is all that. This is our whole rap and rant that we do every summer in the three weeks right, of mourning. Exactly. This is like we that we just love to mourn. The nostalgia is so breathtakingly, hauntingly, chillingly beautiful. So he says it's a venerated tradition of wanting Why to build. Why mess <laughs> with tradition? <laughs> and then he goes and he says it's a venerated tradition of living without the temple. No, we don't venerate not living with the temple. Of course. All these, both these authors are all for, you know, uh, freedom of prayer, yes, freedom of human ways, rights. But it, like you course. said earlier, not in our time. Again, why? Because it's going to create some kind of opposition. He, he mentioned that the Muslims express their concern. What concern? They, spre- they express their outrage uh, and, and uh, intense hatred of anybody but a Muslim who would dare pray in that spot. Is that is you know like pulling the curtain from from their from their lie that it's some kind of a Muslim holy spot from from time immemorial. immemorial. Rabbi, you know, when, when I- Israel was in Egypt and the sages, the elders, didn't want to listen to Moshe because Kotzeruach, because of shortness of spirit, you know, we understand that they were tired, it was difficult, why, all these getting all these extra burdens because Moshe is speaking up. But it was really a, a, a shortness of, sp- of spiritual vision, of, of shortness of, 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 you know, perspective. They, they didn't want to look past their own noses. They didn't want to see what the... F- you know, what the future held for them. They wanted to cut off the future before it could happen. The same thing here, you know, you have aspirations because they're worth aspiring for, because you want to accomplish them, not because there's something nostalgic and, 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 and fuzzy and warm about having an aspiration. Again, I use this analogy a lot, and I think it's in place if in the 1960s uh, people said, listen, you know, in the United States, like freedom, uh, equality, uh, integration, those are wonderful things. Well, I'm all for it, guys, but like not now because there's too much opposition to it. It's going cr- to create civil war, civil dis- disturbance. It's going to create violence. Well, guess what? It created all those things. But show me someone in America now, you know, who's not some kind of a freak who would say, whoa, it was too bad we did all that. You know, America's much worse off for that. America's much better. Everybody knows that. I don't have to go over that. You know, uh, was, was, was it not the right time uh, to destroy apartheid in South Africa? There's apartheid. There is... There is there is racism on the Temple Mount directed against non-Muslims. Israel has the power, because we have the sovereignty, to change that. That's what it's all about, friends. If we want to build a temple, that's our right to want to build a temple too, and it's our right to build a temple. And without addressing this issue, the whole Passover thing is just a fuzzy, warm, nostalgic exactly. thing. It's beautiful. You got you got your stripes, mats, or whatever. You got the you got the soup almonds. It, 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 whatever it is, it's it's all beautiful. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be plenty of programming out there now. You can go to a, a million websites and listen to programs about how much matzah you have to eat, the size of the four cups, how to do the seder, the bitter herb, all sorts of nice things. Uh, that's all wonderful. It's all very, very important. But But somebody has to tell you that this whole thing doesn't really line up at all without the main course. Actually, it's not the main course. It's the afikoman. It's the dessert. It's the piece from the Passover offering. The whole Passover is about the offering because what it really means to be free is to stand up for what Hashem wants in this world, His presence in this world. That's what Passover is all about. And the little bit that filters through to us, the little bit that we're able to, to, to latch on to, has to inspire us to to want more and more and to be better and better and to be the people that we can be. And there's no time for becoming the people that we can be like Passover. That's what it is. That's what we owe ourselves. That's what we owe the world. And it is happening. That's the excitement. It really is happening. Look at look at look at the interest in the Passover offering. Look at the people that are standing up and saying, "I don't care what you think or what you call me. You think it's strange that we want to bring the Passover? Offering? Why? Why? We're Jews. We're in the land of Israel. We keep the Torah. This is what we are." And yes, our own enemy is from within. Our worst enemy is our own feeling of inadequacy and and the chip that we have on our shoulder from the exile, but we are overcoming it. And in the inner, uh, pure kernel of, of every single Jew, we're connected. We're all completely connected to each other, to this land, through Hashem, through the Torah, 
And this is what Passover is really all about. And, it's, and we're getting there. We really are getting there. And the first step is to go up on the Temple Mount in the permitted places in purity and according to our commitment to Hashem's honor and to, and to stake our claim that, that we need to rebuild the Temple and bring this message into the world. So we still have a little bit of time left, Rabbi. I'd like to already uh, wish everybody a very, very kasher and sameach pesach. Kasher, it's only kasher if it involves freedom, if it involves our allegiance to Hashem and to His Word, just as you stated a moment ago. And it's only sameach if we achieve in any measure that freedom, that independence from idolatry, from the mindset that surrounds us, from the chains of the politically correct and, and, and all those other outside influences that shackle us to be what we were last year and the year before that and the millennia before that. No, we want real freedom, real independence, because that's what's kasher and that's what's really sameach. Hak kasher v'sameach. Have a very happy kosher Passover. Everybody, we'll be back on the day right after the seventh day of uh, of Passover, Yisru Chag on what is that? The twentieth, Rabbi? Twenty second. Twenty second of Nisan, the twenty second of April. Chag Sameach.